Oh man, oh man, oh man. It's what? About 5.49 here. AM. Vegas. Summer League, man. Rod. You know what? I owe you so much, bro. You did this last year for me, man. I'm sitting here like, I hit Rod up and I remember him being outside. Go back and look at <laughs> last year's Vegas one. And I'm sitting here now like, oh my gosh, Rod is such a great person. <laughs> Oh, man. But I was like, you know what? If he's good to go, I got to repay the favor, man. This is what the grind is. He showed that and set that example. And I told you, I was like, you know what? I'm going to share my thoughts on this on the uh, on the stream to start it, man. But getting the sleep out of my eyes, got the Restore shirt on, got the cap on. It's ready to go, man. How you feeling? I, I feel good because I'm not broadcasting <laughs> from the surface of the sun. It is... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you, ah. I guarantee you it's 85 or 90 degrees at just before 6 a.m. I guarantee it. 80, yeah, yeah, 84 degrees. 84 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Rod, these numbers, you guys. Rod, these numbers. But you know what? Let me get this pulled down. You know, uh, what a lot of people are doing to uh, the Pistons right now, trying to pull the shades down on them over, like, what, a couple summer league games, but... Let me get into this, man. It's it's great to be on here. What up, though, people? It is your boy, Brandon Dent, a.k.a. Detroit Kool-Aid, and you're rocking out with the Woodward Pistons podcast on the Woodward Sports Network. Look, you already know Mr. Jeff I. Freddy rocking out on the morning Woodward show, but when I get back, we have some cool content that we're going to get down for you guys. And we got some special things in the works. It's going to be popping up in about a month or two that you guys are going to be excited about. But you guys know what time it is before we get things jumped off. It is the drum roll. Got to get the legend introduced here. Hey, yo. Shout out and welcome to the legend, Detroit News Rod Beard. Brother, as always, welcome. And how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm glad to be back from Vegas instead of in Vegas. You can only take about so much of that before you just tap out. Like, look, I can't do this anymore. This is... Next year's trip will be a little bit different, man. <laughs> you just, you wake up angry because so, where I was and you see on yours and it's, so it's before six o'clock yeah. a.m. And the sun is, is out, out. Yeah, like his <laughs> sun is out. The sun is out. Like it's been out all night <laughs> and it's, it's just going back to it. Bro, Vegas is, is so tough in my room. The sun yeah. just hit right in my face. At like five thirty, so like, was... yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. It's it's just, it, I don't know how people live there. It's it's insane. That I do not know. I, like I, going from like the hotel to the Uber, you can kind of deal with it, bro. When I got to Thomas and Matt, because they drop you off in a little tiny area, and I got out. Just walking to like where the stairs were, like let alone having to walk up the stairs. I'm like, wait, y'all making yeah. exercise? Y'all, y'all making me walk up some flights of stairs to get in here? And this heat, it was crazy, man. Like people coming out of the arena, they were hitting it like and dropping like flies. Like, oh my word, this oven! It was wild, man. Like 110. I'm like, this is insane heat, insane heat, man. Like it, it's a good environment though. It, it for my first summer league. Mm -hmm. I really, really, really enjoyed the experience. I have. And I like kind of the, uh, I think Sean Murphy, shout out to him from Half Court. He said it's almost like NBA con. You know, I like mm -hmm. they're taking it from this kind of rugged backdoor NBA kind of training experience and making it uh, a little bit more for, I think, everybody involved, including the fans. We're going to have fans there, you know, make it fun. And so I liked kind of walking around, seeing a different mm -hmm. podcast set up, seeing the NBA experience, you know, the little lounge. Uh, the, the big, you know, uh, NBA 2K24 Kobe um, cover that they had there. There's just a lot of different things. Walk around, some, seeing different players on the concourse. Uh, and then seeing y'all in the media row, man, swag. You know you know, I have to talk about that, right? You got <laughs> Rod, man, you you are an international man of just class. And it, it, just, it just exudes. So I definitely got to say shout out to you on that, man. Shout out to you. <laughs> 
No, it is it is a meat market. It I don't know anything that's even close to summer league. Make Final Four is sort of the same thing on a college level, but it is a meat market for people who are trying to get to that next level in coaching. There's a, a, a spot on the concourse where all of those kind of scouts and um, coaches kind of meet and they're they're chopping it up. There's the tunnel that's underneath where not just the teams that are playing, but their their veteran players are kind of out there and you got agents back there and you've got yeah. uh, just some of everybody. So it is it is a an unreal environment. And I was telling Mike, cause it was his firm, it, it's his first summer league too that you got to get used to that. He said it's sensory overload because it's so many people that you <laughs> you kind of see and you're like, wait a minute, there's Paolo. Wait a minute, there's Cade. And they're not even playing, but they're just here and they're roaming around. Steph Curry shows up. Chris Paul shows up. It's just so many things that are going on that you have to kind of be ready for it to see kind of like, dang. It, there's that person there's this there's there's and then there's the game the game is secondary to everything else that is going on because it is a um kind of celebrity show and it, that's that part of it is fun it is it is and, and honestly being there in a the moment I, I can kind of feel why social media reacts the way that they do because being there you're just like this is great oh cool get to see our rooks you're not really taking it too serious are they hitting some of the marks because you're just kind of in this festive environment like walking in, I, I wasn't expecting kind of some of the reception. You know, I had mm -hmm. my sport, sports stuff on. I was going to get busy out there in the concourse. I got to do an LCA. And people, like, like they recognize the brand. They recognize, obviously, if they see the hat, they're like, oh, you're a Pistons fan? And it was cool to rock with people who are like, hey, we respect what you've been doing over the last year uh, within mm -hmm. the Pistons community. It, it was, it's festive, man. So it's like when I went to social media, <laughs> it was like, whoa. What are, what are people doing? Like, if people were ready to just, and probably still are, rip the draft up and start over anew. And for me, you know, I want to start things. I know the some of the big news is Isaiah Stewart, and we're going to get there. We're going to get there. But I just wanted to be able to touch on Summer League just really quickly. And for me, Asar Thompson, man, I, I want to get your first, I want to get your first impressions, and then I'm going to mm -hmm. share mine, because I believe it's shaping up to look like the player Troy Weaver compared him to. At least mm -hmm. Summer League, just the Summer League of it all. Yeah, I, I thought Asar was um, was very solid, and that's what you were going to get. Cause in, and we've been saying this for weeks and weeks and weeks. You weren't going to get a starter. You weren't. Once you once you ended up with the, the, the number five pick, you were not going to end up with a starter. So you just could do the best that you could to solidify and to look at skill set more so than um, best player available necessary, necessarily. And he didn't handle the ball a lot, but when he did, he was very, very solid. And I saw the, the previous Houston game, the first game, when Amin was just out there dropping dimes. And I'm like, okay, this is a, a different version of, of Amin doing that. This is Osser doing that. Yeah. So he didn't shoot a lot. But what in what variation are you going to need him to shoot? If he's on the the, the floor with Joe Harris and uh, Alec Burks, why is he shooting? Why do you need him to shoot like that? That people want to um, see him shooting volume of threes to see what it looks like. It's not good. Just let's just say that up front. It's not going to be as good as he's not going to shoot thirty five or forty percent from three. Period. But what you want in that second group is a guy who can handle, a guy who's going to get out in transition and make the right plays and isn't going to turn the ball over and just hurt you. And he checks every single one of those boxes and he rebounds. So if Joe Harris isn't a rebounder and if Alec Burks isn't a rebounder, you have a guy out there who's not afraid to go to the glass. I don't, I don't know what else people want from him. They want him to be, a 20 point score what, what what were you looking for because if you were looking for that you stepped into the wrong gym because that's not what what Osser is not at all and you know i don't know if you're describing um andre iguodala or sar thompson when you looked at his game bro like the the ability to make the impact both on both ends of the court especially on offense without having to have the ball in your hands like that mm -hmm. or to be focal point on offense like that that to me was impressive and Shout out to Jeff Iafredi. You know, he was trying to tell the people, listen, 
you don't take much from summer league, but what you take are the things that you know are going to translate. The the skill mm-hmm. set that these players were advertised as having, as well as the weaknesses. That's mm-hmm. why I like what Troy Weaver specifically said. He said, look, his defense is ahead of his offense, but he'll make an impact on both ends of the ball right away. Don't mm-hmm. look for him to come out here and shoot the, the cover off the ball. I think that that was the exact quote. Uh, I'm going to go back and listen to the audio. But he was saying, you know, don't expect to come out and shoot it like at a high clip. We're going to work on that. He has the good mechanics and whatnot. He's in a setting now where I, I believe that they're going to get that part of his game right. But like you said, the impacts he's making, I'm going to read off his summer league stats here. Shout out to Pistons Talk, uh, Anthony Colombo. Good dude. Um, I like their podcast, too, Pistons Talk Podcast. And obviously, they share things up on uh, social medias uh, everywhere. So shout out to them, man. Keep crushing you guys. But um, he posted the summer league stats so far through the first two games. Nine and a half points per game, eight and a half rebounds per game, four and a half assists per game, two steals per game, two and a half blocks per game. You know I like me some stocks, Rod. Four Mm -hmm. and a half stocks per game. And it's really the thing that we wanted to see. We were like, hey, man, if Killian Hayes goes out in summer league last year and just looks like he's uh, kind of, you know, physically there and, and physically imposing. Well, these are that's what these numbers are saying. So yeah. even if people will say, well, two and a half blocks, he won't have that in NBA. Well, maybe he's not, but he's going to have it right here. These are the things that I wanted to see him come out and do. This man is almost averaging a double-double and five assists with four and a half stops. I don't know what much more you need. And when you're talking about that Andre Iguodala type of guy, you start to realize that if he got more opportunities to kind of put the ball on the floor, to kind of be the focal point for some things, this points per game average would be a little bit more. But he's not looking to do that. What if he's looking to get better at the role that he's going to play this season? What if he's looking to actually play the role that he's going to play off of Cade, off of Ivy, off of Monty Morris? All, you know, what if that's what he's looking to do? Get out and transition. Because you know what I really noticed? When he gets the ball off the rim, off the rebound, they let him just go. Go. They, they just, they that, just, that man is that man is gone. But 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 let me let me tell you this. Talk to me. Also, look who he's playing with. You 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 oh, you you, you spit out his numbers. He's playing with Ivy, Duran, yeah. Wiseman, who are all averaging twenty yeah, plus. Not to, maybe 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 Ivy is not twenty plus, but they're all averaging fifteen plus. I'm pretty sure. So where are his points coming from? If if you wanted him to average fifteen in the first two games, with no real point right now, and he's playing with all three of them, so yeah, you can't even really judge it accurately by the first two games. If you look at the next two games and say. Uh, Ivy and Duran are, are uh, they they put them on the shelf and say they're done, and maybe he's playing with Wiseman. Now I look at that and say, well, maybe he's going to handle more now in these last couple of games as opposed to what he did in the first couple, because that that's that's more of what he I would see him being is if you let's say he plays with the second unit, Monty Morris, boom, point guard, boom. It looks completely different at that mm-hmm. point. And he can fill lanes. He can find a different sort of role that he's going to be in. He can cut a little bit more. And in the, that, that's what I liked also, is that he was actually intentionally cutting. So, <laughs> I, I mean. The things we've been talking about on this show. Like, but, where are the guys going back door? Where are the cutters? Where the slides? But that, that's, that's all stuff that you look for. What does he do in this group? It's not Cade. It's not going to be um, the, the the group that starts for the Pistons. But mm. there are a couple of starters in this group. It, it's going to be Ivy and Duran. Yeah. So how does he play around those those guys? But the passes that he made, and everybody's talking about the one that in transition where he he found Wiseman as as the trailer. That's vision. He that, that's vision goggles to see a, a dude that's behind you and and set him up right there where he can finish that thing. That pass. Oh, that one. I thought you were talking about the other one he threw to Wiseman. Oh, let's talk about both of those, actually, because that pass to Wiseman, he set that up before before he ever got the ball. Like, you can mm-hmm. see he looked around. It's, it's the type of stuff you see great facilitators do, people like CP3, LeBron, and even Chauncey Billups. And he kind of looked around, surveyed where he was, got the ball, and it wasn't like when Killian Hayes tried to set up that oop for, was it Eugene or Marui? And on the fast break, tried to just, no, he really set him up 
Uh, it was a savvy move, kind of a vet-like move. Good pass, right in the pocket, right where Wiseman can do something with it. The other pass, the first one he did, that kind of went semi-viral, was I don't know if he got it off the rebound or somebody passed it to him in transition, but he took one dribble and he saw Wiseman. And instead of taking that extra dribble or that gather man, I don't think people understand how hard this is from the half court. He just, boom, and just threw it between the defenders, threaded the needle. Wiseman got it and finished it. It was just like, ooh, because everybody has that vision, but not everybody can make that pass, man. And I just thought, wow, that was nice. A lot of people have to throw bounce. When you usually see people doing that, it's a bounce pass. He just mm-hmm. pocketed it. And it wasn't like he threw it over. Ivy sometimes will try that pass, and it's just kind of over people's head. His instincts, man, and he talked about it. Um, I, I wish I had the exact quote, but he talked about it with uh, with Omar. I think it was Omari Sankofa who posted it, James Edwards, who asked him the question. Uh, he said, look, man, I'm just – I'm really trying to get my teammates involved. You know, mm-hmm. I'm trying to make sure that I can make plays for my teammates. And that – you know, I know it's not the exact quote. That was the summation of it. But it was just his mindset, man, the ideology that he plays the game with. Those six and a half assists and he's playing with an overtime elite. I don't know how skilled those players were, but I would consider that kind of probably making some of your players around you a little bit better, just a little bit better. And that's the impact that I'm hoping he can have as he continues to uh, grow and develop, man. Did you have any other thoughts on uh, some of well, the- So the, the, what some people will say is that um, it, it, that Houston game didn't look so good. And um, I liked what Ivy did in that, the Houston game that he kind of saw that there was a challenge and he wasn't letting them get punked that, um, that Tari Eason and um, Jabari, Smith, Jabari Smith looked like a, <laughs> that man, that man came in with a chef hat on and said, I'm about to cook for all of y'all. And it's a little bit what? of chirping. He, t- he turned around and, 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 and chirped at Cade and, and uh, Isaiah Stewart and, yeah. and, <laughs> They're sitting there on the bench like, what? Bro, Why? the bench is them like, and like, Wise is behind them like, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. Jabari is just, this might be a nice year for him, man. But hey, Summer League, it's Summer League. Yeah, they're, they're looking like, why Why is he pointing over here at us? <laughs> this man is out here playing Summer League. We in street clothes. Why is he pointing <laughs> at us? <laughs> oh, man. I, I like the chippiness of it, though, man. It's, it's nice to see the stars of Summer League kind of going at it. And I like that Jade and Ivy bounce back. You know, people were like, whoa, it looks like he's not passing no star. It looks like he's not passing. And to me, it's like he's out there kind of doing what he's supposed to be doing. It looks like they're running the sets that they're supposed to be running. He's making the plays he's going to be making. Um, there was a couple times where I believed, hey, man, look up, keep your head up, make the right pass. But uh, largely, I think the second game, Ivy went and kind of corrected some things uh, from that first one. Uh, Marcus Sasser, and, and, and honestly, in that Houston game, let me, before I move on to Marcus Sasser, um, I liked what, um, I know offensively is where a lot of people try to judge players, especially early on in summer league with how, much, how many points they're scoring. But defensively, I thought that Houston game is one where they would have done good to kind of leave um, leave Asar on like Jabari and on some of these other players. I thought he actually was doing a decent job defensively uh, in some mm-hmm. of his assignments and some of his matchups. He just moves his feet so well. And they said, um, what was it about K? That he's a keep ball in front star. Mm-hmm. I think, man, like it's still, ugh, goodness gracious. All right, it's summer league, but the tools and the skills, he did it in high school. They said he was going to be able to show these things in summer league. He's doing it. It's kind of like our steps and progressions we did with Duran last year. We said this triage. Can they do X, Y, and Z? He's kind of hitting these small marks, man, that I was hoping he could do. I was wondering, hey, can he be a rebounder? This was something that we struggled with, man, from the wing, even with Jeremy Grant. Mm-hmm. You know, So there's a lot that he's put out there. Defensively, I, I believe that's where he's going to come in right away and be something that we can depend on and kind of be scrappy. Be somebody that's getting into the passing lanes and create your own offense for yourself. But Marcus Sasser, I, I like what I've seen from him. Obviously, um, I don't think it's been as um, opportunistic. You know, mm-hmm. I, I feel like he's playing, like you said, with Ivy. 
uh, Xavier Simpson and some other guys out there. But I, I've liked kind of like the defense, the poise, the step into it, three pointers, things like that. Like some of the things that I'm hoping he's going to be able to bring. Like I'm one, I'm thinking this season he'll have one or two opportunities to step into a three pointer. You know what I mean per game type of thing. He'll have a couple mm-hmm. opportunities to get in and play some really really tough defense. Overall, what was your kind of takeaway of uh, Marcus Sasser? I think Sasser same way um, having to kind of run the point to some degree, handle handle a little bit more. Um, and again, playing with that starting group, you're not going to get a lot of shots. They're, they're just not there. <laughs> so I'm I'm more interested to see what he does in the, the next couple of games as opposed to the first couple. It, it, it's so For some yeah. rookies, it's just getting into a good rhythm and a good flow, and I think that's going to be the case with him. I think we'll see a little bit more as we move forward. That's a great point. And that's, that's what I wanted to do. I thought the starters might play like maybe game one, game two. I'm hoping today, which is uh, going to be my last day here, I'm, I'm hoping that they it's more Asar and Marcus, so mm-hmm. can even a better feel for who they are when they aren't playing uh, fiddle or trying to play a role to see who these guys are because they they come from situations where they were very ball dominant, where they were the guys that their teams depended on, and I think that that's something key to have. Not that you can't be somebody that fits in and plays your role. But there were times even when, you know, in the 04 Pistons, there were times when Lindsey Hunter was able to just come in and do his thing, man. And I'm not comparing these players to, like one-to-one to these guys, but just as it relates to what we're hoping we can depend on from them, there were times when we knew those old teams, if you're talking about restoration, had guys that could come in and just go to work, for lack of a better phrase. But um, overall, I've, I've kind of liked what I've seen. Houston got absolutely busy. They shot the lights out of the ball. I don't know how when a team is that hot, you beat them. We've seen yeah. this beat good teams just because they couldn't miss from three. So it's just, you know, in a regular season. So it's just like how much you can really do. They close the gap to about 10. And um, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nothing you were doing with, with Jabari on that day. He was he no. was just in it. He was just in his bag. Um, the other guy I want to see a little bit more of is, is Buddy Beheim. He shot the he shot very well in both games, and situationally, he just wasn't on the court with um, kind of the starting group. So, if you're going to have uh, Osser and uh, and Sasser, put them with Beheim and maybe Wiseman if he's going to play the uh, the last couple of games. Let me see what that lineup looks like because that's more of a traditional. You got a big, you got a shooter, you got a um, an athletic guy, and then you got a slasher. See how that formula kind of works together. Uh, and I don't know who you put with them in that. Mm. Livers didn't play too. That was um, something that was a little yeah. bit. That was a little bit disappointing that that he wasn't able to because that seemed to be um, the the piece that they were missing. And and I didn't. I wasn't too. Us. Yeah, I I wasn't too uh, crazy about the Duran Wiseman lineup. Because they made Wiseman sort of the five and Duran the four. And Duran did show you some different things with his ball handling and he hit the three from the corner. Um, I might have wanted to see that flipped, but it's summer league. So if you're going to try some different things, this is the time to do it. And um, they rocked out with that. So it's it's not like you're going out here to win summer league. I I haven't seen a team yet that said (laughs) we're going out here to win summer league from the very beginning. This is more about let's put our guys in a position and see what they're able to do. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I know that there's been a lot of chatter about James Wiseman, uh, especially within social media sphere. Um, I, I, I I thought that he played relatively fine. I think people are a little upset with um, perception of tunnel vision with James Wiseman. Uh, and, and he might be leaving some passes out there. I'm hoping that you know, within the flow of film study and things of that nature, and like you said, working on it, that they figure out what if they have, whatever they have to figure out. Because I do believe he presents some really, really, really good uh, potential for the business. You know, Weaver wants those kind of five players across the board at all times of the court that can be these creatives, and he talked about getting this hyped. And that means that Wiseman is something very, very integral to what Troy Weaver sees and how he builds a team. And we know that he has the skill and the talent. This isn't even about a mental thing. It's just about, in my opinion, maybe edging your game just a little bit more. Uh, and I think that that's something that you learn more in film study. He's getting acclimated to being on the court consistently, being within mm-hmm. basketball consistently. Mm-hmm. And he's coming from a situation where he was the number one option 
everywhere else until he got to the Warriors, you know, or that, that he was a guy that was not maybe not number one, but a lot of responsibility placed on him as a player. And coming into the NBA as a number two overall pick, going to the Warriors, I don't know where his mindset is. I know that when we talked as it relates to what type of player he is on the court, I know what type of player he is when he works. You can see he's down. He's slimmed way down. He looks much more toned. He looks a little bit quicker, a little bit more nimble. And he talks about being in the gym three days a week. Uh, as it relates to playing the basketball, I think that that's just chemistry. That's stuff that teams build on. And I think that when you get your connector back in K and things start to flow a little bit more, you get more playmakers out there like Monty. And I, I whether they trade Killian or not, if he's still on the roster, I think that there's a good place for killing on this roster. I really do. It just depends on, in my opinion, future value versus what you can get for him in a trade. But when you get those guys around him, and this is one thing I wanted to caution a lot of people on, it, things look differently when everyone is playing, not fiddle, but augment, augmentative to Cade Cunningham. That's way different. James Wiseman and uh you know encapsulation of hey you're playing pick and roll with Kay cunningham might be a really good player in that situation but james wiseman in summer league where he's looking around at everybody else saying give me the ball and get out the way because he can yeah that's gonna look a little bit different and so that's why i agree with what um troy is saying and you see a lot of these guys are very coachable guys let's see let's see these guys play let's see what monty can do with them because that's what i want to see when i see these guys i'm like okay why we got a little wiggle, wiggle to his game that makes me a lot more comfortable for if it's a pick and roll, the you know guy who's doing the, the screen and switching off to him still has a little bit of height, but might not be the big. You give him the ball, you know you can be comfortable with him having it in his hands because you know he can operate one on one. That those are the types of things that I'm looking at in summer league. How are these guys going to augment and play around and off of K Cunningham, off of yeah. their makers and things of that nature? Because when you get them back, it's totally different. Your 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 whole style of play is going to be different. So. Uh, you know, I like we said, you can't take too much. You draw some some necessary marks and conclusions, but largely, uh, I think day three starts the rookies' summer league. You know, I feel like their preseason was the first two games, and today I really want to see them get going. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit here. Obviously, we got to talk about this um, this Isaiah Stewart deal. Mm -hmm. We talked about it here on the show for a long time about what Isaiah Stewart should get, his value. I think no, not not that I think you said 12 million and you said uh would you go up to if the market 13 what about 14 what about 15 that was kind of where we started as we kind of saw numbers fall you actually picked a number you said uh about 16 and we talked about would we go up as high as 20 and things of that nature and uh, your median or that kind of mark was 16 million a year it, it comes in if he hits all the incentives at 16 million a year. That's I guess the news is four years, 64 million in total. Guaranteed is what like the 15 million dollars a year though. Yeah, fifteen. Fif I think it's 15, and then he's got some incentives to make it um, to get to the 64 total. So you're you're really talking 15 base, and then you've got uh, the team option on the fourth year. So I mean, it's I think. Because I tweeted, it's it's a good contract for the Pistons and for Stewart. And I think the three plus one is good for the Pistons. But for Stewart, given the market, you wanted to lock him up and you wanted to you wanted to have something to show for this draft class. And somebody was asking me before, like, do you think why would they pay Stewart? Why would they bring him back? And I'm like, what do you mean? Why would they bring him back? <laughs> That dude is 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 integral to what they're doing. Well, he's a little undersized, and he's he's a little undersized, and he's not a true center. And I'm like, is Bam Adebayo a true center? Just for what he does, and his ability to grow his game. Because if you looked at him in his rookie year and you look at him now, two different players, completely different players. But that ability to change your game and to add to your skill set is important. I think the front office wanted to bring somebody back. And if Killian's not coming back and they traded Sadiq, then Stu, for what he stands for, was coming back. It was just a question about the number. And for the rest of the market, man, LaMelo Ball is about to make $50 million. Why are we talking about 
Isaiah Stewart making 16 or 15. Why is why is that even an issue? Ant Man. is making and is making 50. 50. And we're talking about 16 as being a problem. Look, Jonathan Isaac makes 17.6 million dollars a year, and he can't really stay on the court. And he got that deal with people knowing he couldn't stay on the court, bro. Like, think about that. We're 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 talking 15 to 16. Like you get your 16 if you hit your incentives. And the way that I'm I'm reading it and seeing it, the cap is gonna go up by 10% every every year to the point that they said by like year two, his deal is not even 10% of the cap. Year two or three. So it's just like this is a decent deal. This is a really decent, it's kind of a prove it deal. It's the same thing they did with Jeremy Grant, and Jeremy Grant proved it. You know, obviously Pistons didn't cash that check. I I don't know if we would want them to cash the check at 36 million a year. Not no way, no how. We talked about that too. We're like, no way, like 30 was gonna be like, ugh, for me. But with Stu, I thought when I saw the number, I kind of went, oh boy, people are gonna have a problem with this. But for me, I was like, it's decent. From what we've seen out of Stu, you're talking about a guy mm-hmm. 32 point, you know, 32 point five, 32 point seven percent from three. Um, his first two years in the league, you know, uh, what was he doing? Shooting under one attempt per game. But then he goes and pushes that up to three, four, or five attempts per game, Rod. And the field goal percentage from three point doesn't drop. That means that boy was putting in work. It'd be different mm-hmm. if the attempts were going up and the field goal percentage was dropping. That means that this is not a person that's putting in work. This is not a person where we're seeing results. But it went. And before the shoulder injury, we touched on this on the uh, in the last pod. Uh, and I heard who was talking about it. I believe it might have been Bryce Simon and Martin Kofor or, or, or another one of our friends in the podcast world. Uh, they touched on it that before the shoulder injury, he was hitting 36% of his three-pointers, man. And we were talking about it on our pod. I went back and listened to some, man. At one point in time, he was averaging 6.1 attempts per game. And he was hitting over 36 or 37 percent of those threes, man. That's insane, insane. That I, I think a lot of people forget or miss is he was moved all over the court, and his roles changed, and the lineups he played with changed, and the responsibilities changed. When Stu got the opportunities to, we were talking about is there going to be a big that can average a double double? Remember what we were saying after the first two months of the season? Yo, Stu is averaging a double double. He's really, really impressed us. And they moved him around the court, and he was able to play kind of everywhere they moved him to at a, at a, at a very, very kind of at least average NBA or, or above level. And that's what that metric was talking about, the one we talked about the last show. The players age 22 and under in this league. He was number 20 for all-in-one impact. That is huge. And I don't think people give that enough credit. His ability to play – not just okay defense on the perimeter, but really good defense on the perimeter. If he can take some marginal steps forward with his three-point shooting, marginal steps forward with rebounding, marginal steps forward, in my opinion, with paint defense, which I think that the paint defense is going to change when you get more guys around him. We talked about this. When Duran's down there with him, he's able to be kind of this Tasmanian devil where he's able to just kind of roam and just cause chaos, whether it's helping down into the paint because he knows Duran is already down there. I can come weak side and help or whether it's playing in the pick and roll game and being able to switch off and and kind of cause havoc up there because guards, when they come off those pick and rolls, they're expecting, hey, I got a matchup. But that's not what's happening when Stu is the one that's stepping out there. These Mm -hmm. are the things that, are are we putting a price on? You know, how much are you paying that? Because we haven't had too many bigs that can do what he can do uh, from a defensive versatility standpoint, even to the point that I've had to say, okay, all right, I know that there's some limitations defensively in the paint, but if this big is able to be at least average in the paint and above average for a big out on the perimeter, that's a plus. That's a plus. And so I want to see him take those steps forward. I I, I think, like you said, I, I, it was appropriate the way you put it. I've been trying to figure out the best way to articulate it, and you're saying it's a good deal for them both. Literally is it. And I would just add the cherry on top that it's a prove-it deal for um, Isaiah Stewart. And Isaiah Stewart himself said he wants to prove Troy Weaver's faith in him right now. Look, yeah, because it, one player like that is 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 that I'm gonna believe in like that is Stu. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. And and people want to compare it and say, well, look at the Grant Williams contract or the the Max Strews or anything. It it you can't it's not do this that. I, no, you talk. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> you, it, it, I mean, but that that's as if he has no value anywhere else. And 
you can look and say, well, they overpaid a little bit. If if you over if you're gonna say overpay and it's not six or seven million, if you, if you paid sixteen and you thought that you could get it from ten, you weren't getting it for ten. <laughs> but you want to. If 16 is an overpay or 15, 15 is an overpay, he's still what the third highest paid player, I believe. Yeah, so that's still the case. If you overpaid somebody and they're your third highest player, paid player, then you okay, you're, you're still getting the books in order. Well, but in the next in the next couple of years, do you know how many people you have to pay? You got to pay Cade. You got to pay Ivy. You got you got to get your book straight. You're gonna have to pay Duran if that's if you're keeping the band together. So this is a bargain at the time when you get to that point and you, you you're having to pay those cats. This will be a bargain, and it, and even if it doesn't look like it now, it will at that point. And so yeah. people people can chill. That's all I got. That's all I got. <laughs> I don't I don't even, I don't even want to go crazy on that because people people get um, overly concerned about not their money. And people get <laughs> overpaid, and that's not even. If you put him out there on the market, he would have gotten probably more than that. And he, he has a tradable contract now, which is just as important yeah. as anything else. If this thing is at twenty, that's not tradable. Yeah, he, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to be traded. I'll say it that way. I think yeah, he, I think that deal. Man, especially when it gets close to his expiration date, it's going to be, in my opinion, very, very valuable. Even if Isaiah Stewart doesn't improve at all, I think where he's at right now in terms of the NBA, if he takes like some marginal steps forward, yeah. But shout out K Cunningham. He uh, put on Instagram, earned, not giving. Congrats, family, for Isaiah Stewart. These guys in a room together, you know, I, I think that they know that they have to improve year on year on year. And my only my only drawback is this: not that Isaiah Stewart is where we want him to be, but with the improvements we've seen already, why can't we let that man just continue to improve? All the things that you said about Andre Drummond, all the things that people, you know, and I'm saying you people said about Andre Drummond, you got a guy who's actually working, and we just heard from Andre Drummond, and he he was finally truthful about a whole lot of things. He's he's been truthful actually for a while about this stuff. Mm -hmm. They just kind of put it out there for NBA rookies and such. You got a guy who you don't have to worry about any of that. You got a guy that other teams respect when they come in. They're like, you know what, bro, don't mess with them like that. You got a guy who's going to come in and tell all these new guys and any old guy to come in, this is the way it's done. Realistically, we got our Udonis Hassan. Mm -hmm. like, and let him improve. Let him take his steps. He's still a young player. Like, that's my thing. Y'all heard me at the beginning of the season say, I don't know if he's necessarily a starter when this team is a playoff winning team. But I'm going to continue to state this. I don't know how quickly this team gets to playoff contention if they don't have a player on this roster like Isaiah Stewart. I just don't, yeah. man. The Celtics wanted him too. Other teams wanted him. I just this is where I get confused, man. The Celtics literally didn't want Grant Williams, and the, the stuff started leaking. We don't like his attitude, like you know, rumors, whatever. But they liked Isaiah Stewart. What are we doing? Yeah, people are people are just trying to be too cute about it, and that's that's not the deal. That's that that okay. Yeah, we got it. We got it. We got to wait till next week because I I could get started yeah. on a whole on a whole different thing. But um, yeah, I I did uh, get to talk to Cade for a little bit too, um, and and he's going to be ready for this year. He mentally and physically, he will be ready for this year. He is okay. um he's in a good place. This this was what I was going to leave everybody. With. I was going to close with this with Cade Cunningham. So I thank you, Rod. It, it, it's it's always amazing how those things work. Rod is like Magic Johnson. With these assists, bro, he just here's the dime over here. I'm just like, let me dunk that down real quick. K Cunningham, shout out Stat Muse at Stat Muse. K K Cunningham since being drafted in 2021, 17.8 points per game, 5.6 assists per game, 5.6 rebounds per game, 1.2 steals per game. One of seven active players averaging 15, five, five, and one. Man, I'm excited to get Kay Cunningham back. I am excited. And, I, and, and this last thing I'm going to share with people, we talked about it before. I'm going to talk about it here. Kay was, look, when I took this pick, and this is from March 7th, 2023, I said, when I took this pick, I didn't know it would be Kay Cunningham's last home post-game press conference of the season. At this point in time, I didn't take no photos there. I put that. But for some reason, I was like, man, 
He was cooking, and they cooked OKC. I said he had 21 points, 11 rebounds, seven assists, one block, and a win over Shy and the uh, and the uh, OKC Thunder November 7th. I miss watching K Cunningham hoop, bro. And I remember that game because they were trying to bully them. Shay mm-hmm. and 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 um, Lou Dortz and those guys, they were like, I love the way they play, but I'm like, stop doing this to our guys. They're too young. <laughs> like, stop. But then K started doing it. And then we won. And it was just like, yo, he almost had a triple-double, but our guys were you know, it is what it is. I ain't going to throw them under the bus like that. He has seven assists. <laughs> they got the W. It's all that matters. I want to get him back on the court, man. Get him back on the court. Troy said he will be ready for training camp. And I'm, I'm glad that you shared that nugget, man. It's always good when we get these check-ins uh, from K. Shout-out to Ashton, the trainer. Shout-out to Cannon Cunningham. Also, um, I know you guys might have seen the Cannon and Ashton uh, interview here. Cannon also stopped by Kuka Hills podcast, Locked on Pistons. Definitely go by there. Check it out if you haven't already. It's a really, really good and insightful interview. And from what I understand, Ashton, has he might have uh, updated his his prediction that he made on our <laughs> channel. <Might've... laughs> Cannon said, I'm not going to spoil it. Go and watch it, man. Also, like I said, shout out to... Some of the others, man, Jalen uh, and CEO's Office Hours, Sean from Half Court, Steve with Res Ball Pod, and Jeff Iafredi on the Morning with Show. I just want to shout those guys out. I'm grateful for all that they do for this platform and all that they provide. And as always, you get the drum roll for the legend here. I appreciate your time. I really do. And I understand holistically more what you've done for me now for the last year, man. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Rob. Yep, you got it. All right, let's get this drum roll going. Hey, yo, shout out to the legend, Detroit News, Rod Beard. Thank you, brother. And I appreciate you all too, man. Like, subscribe. I'm going to check in with some more content from Summer League as well. Till next time, you all.